The urge to kill another human being is as old as mankind itself. We find ourselves looking back on prehistory as a savage and bloody journey towards enlightenment. We imagine the constant struggle for resources, the fights to stay alive. All of it brought animalistic rage and violence. Eventually, we learn to coexist, to organize ourselves into interdependent communities. It is here that the concept of diplomacy was born. We could finally use intellect and words to solve conflicts in the place of brute force and bloodshed. One would think that after entering this time of stability, this age of kings, queens, and empires, that we'd cast aside such trivial things as murder and encourage peace and tolerance. Unfortunately, this couldn't be farther from the truth, for in the wake of modern civilization, we became capable of far greater horrors. Torture, murder, and terror. can diplomacy hold genocide, and I don't think this is possible. Diplomacy alone simply cannot end these things. There's three things you have to consider in that. You have to consider the history, how these things start, progress, how they end. You need the personal experiences of people going through this kind of situation. Then you need to look at current politics of how our government, other governments, are trying to bring these things to a close. These things have been going on for millennia. I mean, we often think of the Holocaust when we heard the word, uh, genocide. The period of the Holocaust and World War II, it was a dark, dark part of our history. And it did shape the rest of the century in many ways. But, go back before that. Go back farther. Much, much farther. You'll see that many parts of history revolve almost completely around situations like these. The number of ordered deaths of a particular people in medieval Europe was second only to the plague. The church's whole campaign for superiority over the other religions had a ridiculous death toll. The hunt for heretics during the Spanish Inquisition. Thousands and thousands of people were getting taken in. They'd be trialed and then executed whether they were heretics or not. This would resurface in colonial America, the witch hunts in towns like Salem. There are a smaller number of deaths, yes, but the principle itself is still there. People were accused, they were taken in, they were trialed, then killed. Premeditated execution. Fast forward and you have the elimination of natives and expanding our country. You got the Mexican and the French revolutions. You have a great power searching for their enemies. Anyone who opposes their agenda is hunted down and killed. Move forward to the early 1900s and you have the Armenian Holocaust, which was a similar incident that predated Hitler by two decades. Go a little bit farther during the height of World War II and you have the dropping of the, the Hiroshima bomb. Even if you look at it as just a strategy of the military to win the war, you can't justify something like that. That was premeditated killings. You cannot rationalize something like that and call it anything but mass slaughter. You're talking about mass murder, General, not war. Mr. President, I'm not saying we wouldn't get our hair most, but I do say no more than 10 to 20 million killed, tops. Uh, depending on the break. So the list, it just goes on. These things start because some powerful force saw it fit, saw it necessary to exterminate these people. They'd announce their agendas to the world occasionally, but their reasoning and their willingness to do these extreme things is not always clear. One great example would be favoring squirrels over rats. Rats spread disease to bite people. Rats were the cause of the bubonic plague, but that's some time ago. I propose to you, any disease a rat could spread, a squirrel could equally carry. Would you agree? Right. 
Yet I assume you don't share the same animosity with squirrels that you do with rats, do you? No. Yet they're both rodents, are they not? And except for the tail, they even rather look alike, don't they? It's an interesting thought, Herr Kuhn. <laughs> However interesting as the thought may be, it makes not one bit of difference to how you feel. You don't like them? You don't really know why you don't like them. All you know is you find them repulsive. The same exact thing can be said about mass murderers. Something in their very nature just drives them to kill. We can study politics as well as the perspectives of the oppressed through modern day examples. I've gathered sufficient understanding of Burma's situation over the last few years, and I credit that to viewing the latest Rambo film. <laughs> Before I even watched that film, I'd never heard of Burma or the atrocities going on over there. I wanted Rambo still to be a lost man, a man who's wandering the world. So the idea was to seek out a place that would be the worst hell on the planet, the worst offender of human rights, abuses, wholesale slaughter, ongoing genocidal war. And we found that place to be considered by many, including the United Nations, as Burma. What's ironic about the film is that it's been embraced by the people standing up to the oppression. If you're caught talking about the film, viewing the film, distributing the film, you can get thrown in jail for over 10 years, and sometimes you can even get killed. If that's any indication as to what kind of government the Burmese junta is. The history of Burma is one of the military. And the military is used to getting this way. They just uh, shoot, torture, throw people in jail. They were never good guys, but the previous dictators were not nearly as cruel as the one that's in power now. Everything is completely controlled, so the people are constantly ruled by fear. Your problems in Burma are, are pretty clear. There are child soldiers, I think 300,000 in Burma. There's torture used on practically anybody picked up. If there's any trouble in the streets, the soldiers shoot and kill. And they'll hold you in a prison with no charge for years and years on end. There's probably 1,900 political prisoners at this time, maybe more. This military regime is like a mafia or a criminal syndicate. So the regime spends up to half of its national budget on their military, even though they have no external enemies at all. They're only using their weapons against their own people. Simply put, the Burmese government is responsible for an immeasurable amount of deaths, and most of them are their own citizens. It's one of the longest running civil wars or genocides that the world has ever seen. And the Burmese government has been making an effort all this time to keep these issues a secret from the rest of the world. But works such as Rambo or Burma VJ, it shows the terrible things that are going on over there. Participation from other countries is limited, to say the least. While there's a handful of peaceful organizations offering their support, there's been very little face-to-face -face confrontation with the Burmese junta. Work from the UN, who the citizens have long requested help from, has been mostly bureaucratic. These people only have a select few resistance fighters to combat the things going on. With the government being unwilling to disclose the issues or to discuss solutions with neighboring countries, the only way to invoke any major change would be aggressive involvement of willing, able-bodied nations such as our own. You can debate for years and years about this kind of thing, and it's not going to bring any change unless you execute some sort of solution to handle the problem. World War II, once again, is a perfect reference for this situation. If we've learned anything in the past, it's that those with great power, those with an agenda as evil as mass slaughter, will not end their ways with diplomacy alone. Military action must always be taken before any negotiation between the governments can occur the military must intervene first. It doesn't have to be combat per se, if it amounts to that, so be it. But with a country as strong as Burma, there's just too much power in the hands of those willing to carry out these atrocities for there to be any change without a military force of equal or greater power stepping in to say, this isn't right, we need to stop this. Live for nothing, or die for something. together. Whatever the problems are, and whatever the joys are, we're definitely in this together.